Welcome again to Highly Questionable. What do you like on the show today, Bo? We're going to talk about a certain Hall of Fame receiver. And by we, I mean them, because I ain't talking about them. Vamos, papi. The Russell Westbrook thing, he was a Steph Curry. Hey, raise your hand if you went to sleep at halftime, because it seemed as though the Thunder had an insurmountable lead on the Clippers. Then a whole bunch of stuff happened. The Thunder shot under 7% in the last seven minutes, and somehow Russell Wilson thought, or Russell Westbrook thought that that was the way to win the game because Russell Wilson and Russell Westbrook have nothing in common. Russell Westbrook is the best kind of can't shoot. It's he doesn't know he can't shoot. He's a 28% career three-point shooter. And this begs the question, as the Thunder lead by 17 in the fourth quarter and lose the game, only scores seven points in the last eight minutes. Any difference between Billy Donovan and Scotty Brooks? Because at the end of games, these teams seem the same as they've always seemed, which is it's Westbrook and Durant doing whatever they can find. And in that case, it wasn't very good. Now, one thing to be fair, we've come to the part of the season where we pay more attention to them. And Monty Williams has been an integral part of getting Billy Donovan acclimated to the league. And Monty Williams has a lot to deal with right now. That's one point. But the biggest difference between the Scott Brooks era and the Billy Donovan era, the Billy Donovan era doesn't play nearly as good a defense. Far Billy. Oh, bring no. back Scotty. Oh, yeah. Fire Billy. I kind of like that. Bring back Scotty. That'd be fun. Fire what Billy. Kind of chance bring is back Scotty. Fire Billy. Bring chance. back Scotty. He's so peppy about the firing part. By the way, through all of this, you don't hear anybody talking about, well, maybe we need to hire Scott Brooks. I haven't heard that once. That's a really wordy chant. If you were T.O., would you fire back at Marvin Harrison or let it slide? Fire back is an interesting choice of verbs there. Uh, Bomani's not going to want to have anything to do with this conversation. Marvin Harrison has a past that I'm a little too comfortable talking about, and Bomani doesn't want to talk about it at all. So here is the quote from Marvin Harrison on T.O. when asked in a radio interview, quote, I wasn't concerned at all about T.O. I'm not concerned about T.O., not one bit. I was concerned about myself. I wasn't worried about splitting the vote with anyone. That was it. The person who was supposed to get in got in. That was me. And if he didn't get in, that's his problem. He could talk all that other bleep like he He's been doing that's on him, but I'm in. My jacket is gold. I won't look in the rear view for anybody. So he can get his bleep in whenever he gets in. If he gets in, if he doesn't get in, that's too bad. To hell with him is the end of the quote. T.O. is probably going to stay silent on this one. T.O., by the way, while Marvin Harrison was very quiet during his career, you're not going to help me at all here, are you? Marvin Harrison, very quiet during his career. Not quiet here. T.O. was better than he was. I said it. There it is. Let's wipe and go to the next thing because I'm afraid. I'm a little bit confused here. What was this whole segment about? I don't. I, I heard a name, and then all of a sudden, it all went blank yeah. for me. I just. I don't know. Back to whatever it was I was doing before. Marvin Harrison. You know, this guy sounds like a studio gangster. Oh, you know? Poppy, don't do that. Come on, man. Dad. Dad. I'm sorry, Bomani. I'm sorry. <laughs> now he's gone too far. What the hell is I, wrong I, I with don't both know. of I'm you? I'm sorry. Well, I thought I was okay. I'm sorry. I regret the last few minutes of my life. <laughs> Should more conferences follow the Ivy League and eliminate tackling in practice? Yes, the Ivy League has decided that there will be no more tackling in practices. This is a move being made with an eye toward the issues with head injuries and trying to lower and prevent them. One thing is not going to see this sweeping the nation. The reason is the Ivy League is playing according to a different set of rules. They're playing with no scholarships. They don't compete in the one double-A playoffs. So if the football isn't that good, I don't think that winds up being an issue. But you can look at the NFL and see what's happening. It's hitting has decreased in practice. The tackling in the games has also gotten worse. There's not going to be any one conference in major football that'll be the one to say, we're going to be the conference that doesn't tackle well. How about this, though? Bomani made a couple of the points for why the Ivy League could do this. Another reason they can do this, football doesn't actually make money there. And what this exchange is, is bodies for money. That's what we're doing here. It's the transaction. It's cold. It's unpleasant. We're trying to make a violent game safer. That's kind of oxymoronic. But they can afford to do this because, literally, they can afford to do this. Also of note, the only way to make football safer seems to be less football. What are we doing, guys? You know, how would the NFL survive without all that talent coming from the Ivy League? You yeah, know, you got right. a lot of talent coming out of the Ivy League. He's right, right. Ryan right. Fitzpatrick would never play in the league, and who else you got? Oh, 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 buddy with the mugshot. You remember him? Desmond oh. Bryant. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Put, put, put the mugshot up there. If that doesn't say Ivy League, what does? Right there. Would you want to see Conor McGregor box Floyd Mayweather? 
no, I don't want to see this. I know Conor McGregor is fun. He is colorful. I know that we like in boxing and in the mixed martial arts to sort of race traffic and have different races, ethnicities, fight. It sells and it's fun. But this particular fight wouldn't be any good. Conor McGregor is not a boxer of Floyd Mayweather's caliber. Him going in there would be as bad as Floyd Mayweather trying to wrestle him on the ground. Conor McGregor wouldn't have any kind of chance against Floyd Mayweather. I just want to ask a question. Is this how thirsty people are to find somebody to beat Floyd Mayweather? Because Floyd Mayweather at any point can decide to come back to the ring and make a zillion dollars because y'all want to see somebody beat Floyd so bad that you have to go over to MMA and try to find some technicalities on how to make this happen. Remember, people were bringing up whether Ronda Rousey could beat Floyd Mayweather in a fight, a fight that would be the worst idea ever, just so we're clear. Floyd, if I'm you, I'm never coming anywhere near a ring again. I let the world be mad because I'm just not going to lose no matter how bad we all wish it could happen. Coming up next on my son's TV show, we talk to Jared Allen. One day I told him, I said, you're soft, I'll run right through you. And I ran at him thinking I was going oh, to run no. right through him, oh, and he no. just, uh, whack, oh, no. kicked me in the chest. <laughs> Joining us at the beach today, courtesy of Pride Los OTC, is Jared Allen. All right, he just retired, but he's one of the best pass rushers in the game when he played. Let's get to know him a little bit better. Jared, what's the story of you uh, wanting to run away from home when you were a kid and dad saying, never mind, you don't need to run away, I'll take you? <laughs> I see my dad talks too much is what he does. Uh, <laughs> no, you know what? I thought I, was, I thought I was really cool at the age of like 12 and my dad was mad at me for something and uh, I basically told him like, cool, I'll run away. So he was like, hey, come on, hop in the car, let's go for a drive. So he drove me out to the field and he was like, you want to run? There's the city. Get out the heck, get the heck out of my car. And I was like pulling my legs. Of course, I was crying like, ah, I'm so sorry. It'll never happen again. One of those uh, tough love moments, right? So now when I get older, I should have called his bluff, see where he was really at. <laughs> yeah, but where were you going to go? Like that, that uh, no, like, yeah, there was nowhere to go. I was going to have to walk <laughs> back to the uh, field. It was either that or, you know, early child labor, which wouldn't have been good for anybody. Can you tell me about this mythical menace that is your grandfather? I'd like to hear. I've heard stories about uh, this is the, the crazy has been hand me down right through the family. Yeah, my, my granddad is uh, he's, he's an amazing American. Uh, you know, he served our country uh, awesomely for 23 years in the United States Marine Corps. So he's kind of kind of my hero, you know, uh, just because that that's who I looked up to. And he uh, he's, he's a tough SOB. He still lives up on the same ranch he has since, you know, I was I was young and uh, you know, still doing all the chores up there by himself at like 85 years old, just just rocking it. Well, Jerry, we appreciate the heartfelt stuff, but they call the man the master blaster. Like, like example of the tough <laughs> thing yeah, we're he talking was, uh, he about first, here is what? He was first force recon. Uh, he was a weapons and bomb specialist all the way back to Korea and two tours of Nam and, and did a whole bunch of stuff. So, uh, yeah, he's got a little crazy to him. Uh, he's the one that taught me how to shoot when I was like five years old. Um, I thought I could beat him up one time, and uh, he roundhouse kicked me in the chest. Yeah, see, that's that's what that's, that's what, what we're going for. You tried yeah. the master blaster. <laughs> that's, that's yeah. The so uh, at the time, right, you were like the defensive player of the year when he did it to you, right? Something yeah, like probably. Yeah. He, oh, he's still. I'm terrified of my grandfather. Yeah, he's like five, maybe five ten, and I'm absolutely terrified of him. I still am like, yes, sir. Like, don't no eye contact. Like, look look to the left. <laughs> don't. What what made you try to fight him? Like, what made the man have to roundhouse kick you? Well, I was young, so I he, so here's the deal. My grandfather always gave. He knew I liked cheese sandwiches with butter, right? He thought it'd be funny to put mayonnaise on my cheese sandwich. He knew how much I hated mayonnaise. I'm the only person with a mullet who doesn't like mayonnaise. Okay, <laughs> so he would put cheese on or cheese. I, I think it was cheese and butter. So I'd take a bite and it'd be cheese and mayonnaise. And then he'd make me sit at the table until my sandwich was gone because we weren't allowed to waste food, right? So he did it, I knew he, he knew he did it on purpose. So I was like five or six, I decided, you know, I'm big enough to take grandpa now. <laughs> so one day, I, one day I told him, I said, you're soft, I'll run right through you. And I ran at him thinking I was gonna oh, no. run right through him oh, and he no. just, uh, whack, oh, no. kicked me in the chest. <laughs> I love that he didn't even do it slow. Like, he did roundhouse kick. Like, that's unbelievable. I can't think of anything funnier that he could have done to you violently than a roundhouse oh, kick. Oh, it was, it was hilarious. And then he picked me. I cried and ran to my dad, and he was like, I told you Grandpa wasn't soft. And then, you know, made me, eat my, made say, me eat my how, cheese mayonnaise sandwich. Yeah, how did it go when you tried to run it down? Because your dad had to laugh in your face, I love right? the idea that Grandpa roundhouse kicks you, and then Dad takes you out to the wilderness and leaves you there. Yeah, the idea yeah. So, uh, yeah, it was one of those, a uh, lot, of, lot of tough love in my childhood. You've been quoted as saying that in your early years, you would never say no to a fight or a beer. Can you give us, in retrospect, the time you should have said no 
to a fight that you look back on and we're like, oh, that was a poor choice by me. Yeah, the time I tried to fight my grandfather. <laughs> yeah, well, see, well, after that, you, we would have thought you'd learned your lesson by then, but apparently not. No. So, yeah, you know, I, I made, you know what, when you're young and, uh, and meatheady, I call it, you know, it's a meathead syndrome. You think you're tougher than you can always be. But uh, my older brother, my older, so this was a good one. So we were probably, I don't know, 13 maybe. Uh, I was probably 13. He was older, maybe, I don't know, maybe a little younger. Heck, I don't can't remember. But we were, I remember we were at the ranch and uh, my dad was out doing something. And, you know, we're, we're sitting there. We're, we're, it started out just playing hallway football. And that always escalated to more. You know, anybody who has brothers understand how that escalates. And uh, so we got to fighting in the hallway. I ended up getting thrown through the wall. So I was like, ah, crap. You know, so that kind of put the end of the fight. Now it was like, how do we patch the wall so dad won't see it? So being the genius that I am, I decided to put paper, uh, like paper bags over it and tape it on the wall, thinking dad <laughs> couldn't remember it, even though the wall was white and the paper bags were brown. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, he goes, yeah, I said, I think it was like 12 or 13. I can't remember how old I was. But um, so dad comes in and not only, <laughs> Not only are we, uh, he comes in, of course, first thing you see is the giant gaping, or sees the paper bag, takes it off, there's a giant gaping hole in the wall. You know, I'm like, crap, so I'm thinking my older brother, he's got my back, we're gonna take this hand in hand. Nope, threw me under the bus. So not only did I get my butt kicked by my brother, then I got my butt kicked by my dad for, uh, for damaging the wall. So yeah, that's, that's another one I probably shouldn't have done. The worst ones have all come at the hand of family members, as you can see. <laughs> Give us a guy you played against that you were just overwhelmed by his strength, that everything you were doing, none of it was working. Oh, you know what? Um, there's been a couple guys. So Jonathan Ogden, I, I got played against him. He was a, a beast. Walter Jones, just his pure athleticism was a beast. But my, my favorite story to tell everybody is, is was a teammate of mine, Willie Rofe. So my second year in the league, in, in no disrespect to anybody who plays left tackle, I think Willie Rofe is, is the best ever. Um, <laughs> I think it was my, my second year in the league. I remember my rookie year. I was like 280, and uh, we were in training camp, and we used to do half-line drills, Oklahoma drills, right? It was Coach Ramil. So I, first we come down. I, hit, I had to go against Willie, so I hit him as hard as I could under the chin and locked him out, and uh, Greg Wesley came down and smacked Priest hole right, uh, right in the hole. Vermeil lost it, right? Like, don't everybody touch the ticket. That's our ticket to the Super Bowl. Don't you ever touch Priest Holmes. Line it up, do it again. Like, crap, I got to do this again? I just had a good <laughs> rep. Can I get out? You know, I was good. And uh, so we lined up again. I hit Willie as hard as I could again and tried to lock him out. That dude picked me up off the ground, ran with me for about three, four yards, dumped me on the back of my neck, and as I tried to get up, speared me in the back. And I knew from that day forward, Holy hell, that, I, I, I gave him everything I got, and he just ate me up. Like, he just let me do it the last time. This time he showed me who he really was. And I tell you what, from that day forward, I was like, that guy's going to be my best friend on the team. And I used to ask, Willie, how do I beat this? How do I do this? And I did not want to get embarrassed like that again. Oh, he treated me like a little child. It sucked. Yeah, it sucked bad. That's a tremendous story. We're going to go to a three shot here. Uh, sorry we didn't celebrate your career more. It's all, <laughs> it's all roundhouse kicks and Willie Rope kicking your ass. Sorry. I mean, you had a great career. We didn't oh, yeah. do very that, well that, in celebrating. That's your all the good stuff yeah. is the other stuff. Jared, Poppy wants to crack at you. He wants to roundhouse kick you in the chest with a question. Go ahead, Poppy. Jared, how do you propose to your wife? How did I propose to my wife? Uh, I yeah. was on my way deer hunting. And we were in the cab of my, uh, we were in the truck driving up to go deer hunting. And we were just kind of talking about where we saw ourselves in the next few years. And uh, I showed her a text message I had sent to a buddy of mine who was a jeweler out in uh, Las Vegas and asked him, you know, that I needed a ring because I was thinking about proposing to my wife. And she said, are you serious? And I said, well, only if you're going to say yes. Otherwise, it's a joke. <laughs> so right then and there, I, uh, I proposed to my wife in the truck, in the, in the, you know, in the front seat of my truck while we were driving a deer camp with no ring. And, uh, That's what I was about to say. You said you use a text message as a proxy for a ring? Yeah, I said, what do you think about this? And uh, she was like, are you serious? I said, Jared, well, Jared, yeah, you gave her a dead serious. deer before you gave her the ring? <laughs> no, nah, sad part. I didn't even get a deer on that trip. So, uh, yeah. Oh, so she didn't get the anything. Way okay. at, the way I looked at it, she, could, she, designed, you know, she got to design her own, her own ring. But, uh, yeah, I proposed okay. without a ring. That's true love right there. All You're right. the man. Yeah, you should, let's just be clear. Yeah, I love it. You, you, you need to teach a class. It's truck. That's unspeakably lame, Jared. Thank you for being on with us, sir. I appreciate it, guys. Thanks a lot.
never been afraid to say what's on my mind at any given time of day because I'm a renegade. Never been afraid to howl about anything. Anything? Anything. Anything. Renegade! Broadcast from the Clevelander Hotel on beautiful South Beach, Miami. Time to play the game that is an extremely selfish lover. Do you question? You give us topics and events, and we question. Do you question if this kid is cooler than Porzingis? Oh, Porzingis was in the news yesterday because he was mopping the floor with Darren Ravel. Is this Darren Ravel or is this somebody else? Let's see what we've got here. Same event. Oh! Oh, oh. Porzingis. That right there is Nick's back. Oh, oh, he, he dabbed, dabbed on him through his legs and dabbed on him. I mean, I understand that poor Zingas is just trying to be a good sport, but you got to pin that to the glass, buddy. Like, you can't have a little man styling on you. Like, you want to let him go by you and get a layup? Ha, ah, that's very cute. You got a wonderful moment. You're going to send it through my legs? A flagrant two might be in order. Hold on a second, though. Bomani is uh, advocating violence against a child in this case, which I think is probably not a good idea. I don't think Porzingis was letting him do anything. Let me see here. I think this kid got by on Porzingis. You First think- of all, I'm not advocating violence against a child. I'm advocating the kind of basketball that I grew up with. And I guarantee you, my father, who loves me dearly, would have put me on the ground for that. I think Porzingis was trying there. Poor Ravel took the brunt of it, though. Ravel comes next, and poor Ziggis wouldn't have any of it from him. That's right. Yeah. Oh, Darren. Oh, Darren. Look at how hard Ravel goes after that rebound. <laughs> That's what you call that? <laughs> oh, he went after it hard. Time to play the game that likes to be tickled. <laughs> See? That's un- oh, no. It's unpleasant, all of it. You tell us what to watch on television tonight. We'll tell you if we're intrigued. Oh, get out of here. In Arizona, Brewers spring training. Brewers versus Cubs. I mean, really? No, thank you. The Cubs are the favorite to win the World Series, by the way. But let's check in with a Brewers minor leaguer, Brett Phillips. He's got an unusual way of finding things funny. Watch. Hi, guys. It's a uh, it's Monday. We're going to do Mom Joke Monday. As you all know, my mom has a lot of corny jokes. So we're going to tell a few to Mr. Brett Phillips here and see if we can't get him to laugh. So why did the stadium get hot after the game? Because it was hot. All the fans left. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good, right? <laughs> How do you find Will Smith in the snow? Will Smith, that's you. You look for his fresh prints. We're not a prince. Prince. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, those jokes weren't funny at all, and uh, that could have been laughter or the sound of a man drowning. Bomani, are you intrigued? He didn't get that Fresh Prince joke, no. which makes me feel, and among other things, very old. But the other thing here, um, I was expecting a different kind of mom joke. It was really a bummer to find out it was jokes by his mom rather yeah. than, you know. Yeah, yeah. Bobby, are you intrigued? Oh, see, see, you know, you know, yes, I'm very intrigued, you know, but I also got a joke, you know. I also got a joke, you know. What kind of bagel can it fly? What kind of bagel can fly? That's right. A plain bagel. A plain bagel, I think, is what he meant to say. On Lifetime, child genius. Have we ever said yes to this? I feel like these always make us sad, and then we worry about the kid's future. Let's see, what do we got? Adrian, are you ready to begin? I'm ready as I'll ever be. Okay. (laughs) Vicissitude. V-I-C-I-S-S-I-T-U-D-E. Correct. Anstitutious. A-D-S-C-I-T-I-T-I-O-U-S. Correct. Yeomanry. Y-O-E. Incorrect. Lilliputian. L-I-L-I-P. Incorrect. Sorry, Drake. 
you spell zero words correctly. Orchidaceous. O r c h i d a c e o u s. Correct. Claire, you answered all ten questions correctly. Outstanding. I got a perfect score, but th it wasn't that impressive for me because I don't ever crack under pressure. I mean, Derek did. Derek cracked under pressure. Derek got a zero out of ten. Did you see that? Well, Monty, are you intrigued? Yeah, Derek hates her guts, and if we're going to be fair, you can't let him come on next week, can you? Because I thought this thing was about child geniuses, and I feel like 0 for 10 is a little bit more. I could have gotten more. 0 for 10. I'm not a child genius. Poppy, are you intrigued? Oh, see, see, I'm very intrigued, but listen, you know, I could never follow any of those words. I could not spell any of them, right. and I don't know the meaning of one of right, them. Right. That's right. You know the meaning of any of them? I just little Laputian is the only one I knew. I didn't know any of the others. That's right. You know, I mean, I don't know. If somebody mentions one of those words to me, I say, what? Is that a different language? You yeah, know? right. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Spell Thibodeau. Tom Thibodeau. Spell it. D-E-E-B-U-T-C-E-H. <laughs> D butcher. That's right. D that's butcher, because he looks like a butcher. Well, that's what he just did the there. Butch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. I got it right. <laughs> I don't know why you made it. D. You see, I can tell a joke. <laughs> <laughs> that's all the time we have for today. Thank you for watching. Tomorrow, same time. Thanks for watching. Gracias. See you mañana. Yes. Do you hear about the two guys who stole the calendar? What happened to them? They just got six months. No. <laughs>